Thank you for waiting. Uh, I would like to welcome everyone to AES Malaysia Section's monthly mixer. This is our monthly activity and our social gathering. Traditionally, we always hold this every second Wednesday of the month from 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. Well, obviously, before this, before you know COVID and before lockdowns, we would actually meet in person. But um, obviously, in this past one and a half years, everything has moved online, all right? But I'm really, really um, happy and really, really excited that we have a very, very special guest. And I'll talk a little bit more, okay? Now, uh, this Monty Mixer is actually open to all members. It's open to members and also non-members alike. So, right, you are more than welcome to join us for the networking, these, these Monday meetings and, you know, other programs such as today, right? We have this special webinar. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is JD Wong. I am the uh, current uh, serving president for AES Malaysia section. I also have a few other of my um, co-colleagues, right, in the committee. Uh, Mr. Ng Ming Fu is the uh, vice president. Uh, Valerie Kang is also one of the committee members, right? If there's any questions, you can always get in touch with me or any of the committee. I want to uh, give a special acknowledgement to Mr. Mike Padero. Mr. Padero is the president of the AES Philippine section, right? Um, so, That's right, baby. Awesome. Yes, I'm here. Great. And right? uh, congratulations to you guys. Uh, it's uh, it's an honor to be invited to your your uh, weekly or or monthly by monthly is it it's it's monthly uh, yes yes and as a matter of fact if i'm not mistaken there are some members of aes also philippine section that are right. joining tonight they're That's also right. joining tonight i think you know it's a very good endeavor that we have this cooperation going on it's going to be really nice if we have some cooperations within the asean region and we can further more on our knowledge uh, about audio and uh, practice, you know, uh, good audio in coordination with uh, AES, Audio Engineering Society. Yes, congratulations to you guys. All right, thank you. And thank you so much for joining and also all, right, uh, all the attendees who are from uh, AES Philippines as well. So the topic of today's webinar, okay, as uh, you all will know, is hearing the audio engineers, right, most uh, valuable asset. I believe that most of us are audio engineers, but some of us, of course, are also uh, enthusiasts. Some of us are also students. Our special guest is Dr. Shasa Aziz. She is the CAO and uh, head audiologist at the Artistic Hearing Center, which is based here in Malaysia. Okay, right. Hi, Dr. Shasa. Hi. <laughs> right, right. Those of you who actually came in the meeting earlier, we already heard us uh, uh, chatting a little bit. Lah, okay. Right. So um, before we start, just a few guidelines, a few reminders to ensure that you know, our meeting will run smoothly. So um, the entire presentation will take around an hour. This is going to be followed by a short Q&A questions. And once the uh, presentation, once the webinar itself is done, right, you may leave if you uh, if you have other plans. But but for those who wish to stay and you know hang around until our meeting ends at 10 p.m., right, you are most welcome to do so. Lah. Second point, please ensure that your microphones are muted when you're not speaking, right? So as to prevent your right background noise, feedback, echo, and all that. Okay, right? We're all audio engineers. We all have to practice good audio as well when we are attending all the uh, all these kind of online and, and online meetings. Okay, um, I mentioned earlier, please be informed that the meeting is going to be recorded. So if you don't want to be recorded, please you um, feel free to turn off your camera, okay? This is just um, uh, just to let everyone know, okay? Uh, if you have any questions, right, for Dr. Shasa or AES, right, or myself or any of um, uh, the AES committee members, please type them in the chat so we will bring it to Dr. Shasa's attention during the Q&A session, all right? Uh, but if you have a question that you suddenly that suddenly pops up in your mind, okay, you can right, go to the reaction site, right, just raise up your hands, okay, and we will get to the question ASAP, okay. Um, before we start, I'd like to just share a very short video, it's about two and a half minutes, 
of our activities over the past year and a half. Okay, you're right. So let's sit back and relax. I'm going to share this short video first. So yeah, hopefully you enjoyed, right? There's just a short uh, video kind of showcasing what are the stuff that's been going on the past one and a half years here in AES Malaysia. Lah. Without further ado, uh, I'm not going to hand the meeting over to our special guest and our presenter, Dr. Shasa Aziz. Thank you so much, JD. Assalamualaikum. A very good evening, everybody. Um, let me share my screen first. So again, I'd like to say thank you so much to JD, to um, AS Malaysia Society, um, and especially as well my producer, <laughs> Ayat, for, um, for this opportunity to uh, share my knowledge with all of you, very fine people here. So... Um, Please do ask questions if you have any. Okay, so a very quick one for, uh, about me. So I am an audiologist by profession. I am the CEO and founder of Ear to State Hearing and Balance Center. Um, Kumbar Utan and also Ula Uli and also I'm a, music, I'm a singer songwriter. Um, a very recent one. So um, uh, I've I started my career as an audiologist when uh, wait. Um, I'm not going to give away my age, but a while ago, and I did that in UCL, University College of London, and I did my Doctor of Audiology in Florida. I was staying in the UK for almost 10 years, but I was working in St. Mary's Hospital for about six years. And then I decided to come back home to Malaysia, and I worked a little bit uh, for, for a bit at uh, Oticon Malaysia, which is a manufacturing company. Um, and then I decided to open up my own company. So the name is Eartistic because I wasn't sure whether I want to go to the clinical side or the musical side. So it's not those typical, you know, like best hearing, audio lab. They're all very typical names for hearing centers. So um, I'm definitely in between because... Um, 
to be honest, um, I've always been in the world of music since I was little. I've been a dancer, a music musician, and uh, I was an ice skater. Um, so a lot of my life revolved around music. So I always, I always wanted to become a music engineer, but I ended up being an audiologist. So maybe <laughs> this is my way to go in there with everyone here. Um, at least I, I'm able to share my knowledge with you. So again, if you have any questions, just just give me a buzz. At Ear to Stick Hearing and Balance Center, we see patients with anything to do with the ear, literally from the prevention, uh, diagnostic to rehabilitation. For today's session, I'm going to talk about um, how the hearing starts, and then how do we cure it, and then at the end, I'll talk about how do we preserve it, because that's the most important part for all of you to do right? Because making music, you need to have good hearing to make good music, right? I've got about seven branches across Semenanjung, Malaysia, um, but I'm mostly in Kuala Lumpur. So I see patients for hearing, vertigo, and tinnitus, and we do the assessment as well as rehabilitation. So we partner with a lot of hospitals and a lot of brands for us to uh, cater Malaysians. Okay, so let's talk about hearing. I was going to ask this question, but this... Uh, page popped up too early. I was going to ask you guys, do you know when do we hear? When we start hearing? Uh, I'm assuming that you've already re uh, you've already seen this. So we can we start hearing at the age of um, uh, five months in the mom's womb. So we, we can hear literally very early in, state, in, 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 our, in our life. So um, that's, that's how early we are exposed to sound. And this is how the anatomy of the ear looks like. So can I know from everyone here, has anybody here done their hearing assessment? So if you have done, just put yes in the chat. Okay, that's, that's a bit of a yes. A long time ago, okay, when I was really young, okay. Brilliant. So we have some who've done, who've, who have done it and some who have yet to do it. So hopefully you will do eventually. Uh, okay, so this is how our ear looks like. I think we all know because this is our asset. So there's four parts of the ear. In this picture, you only see three, right? Actually, there's four parts of the ear. We have the outer ear. We have the middle ear. We have the inner ear, which is the main part of our ear. Not really, actually. The brain is the main part of our ear. So we have the auditory cortex. So the sound that comes through our ears passes through from the outer ear, middle ear, and uh, into the inner ear, which is the cochlea. And the cochlea acts as a gate to the main part of the brain, which is the auditory cortex, where it's, it processes sound. That's how all of you beautiful people make beautiful music. Okay? So... Of course, for you to make a beautiful music, the door has to be able to open properly, right? So that's where uh, cochlear is so important. Okay, so I'm not going to bore you with like too much clinical parts. So um, again, that's the outer ear, the external ear where we have our ear wax, we have our ear canal, where we put the um, headphones, where we put our ear plugs, everything obviously over here. And then the middle ear is where um, the aeration is needed. Have you ever been on a, a, uh, on a car ride or on an airplane where you suddenly felt like, oh, there's a pressure building up your ear? Like, and then you have to blow your nose to pop it up. So that's where the middle ear come into place. The, the whole idea of middle ear is to um, make sure that the pressure inside our body and outside our body is equal. So... If there is a, a difference in pressure, then obviously you will have a buildup, like a, you will have a pressure buildup. And when that happens, you can have infection. Okay, so uh, so obviously that's the middle part of the ear. Now that's little bones here, so important. These three little bones here actually um, imparts information from the outside, which is the acoustic information into vibration. And this vibrating uh, bones will then uh, give the input into the uh, cochlea and then through the fluid inside the cochlea, that's when um, it, um, from the vibration, uh, it then changes into electrical uh, pulse into our brain. So that's how sound obviously passes through our um, ear sections, all those four sections. Now, the most important part of our cochlea is this little hairs 
So these are how healthy hair looks like, okay? So when we are born, or uh, when we are obviously nearing to five months, when we're in the tummy, this is how beautiful our ear um, hair cell looks like. So this is placed in the cochlea. So I'm going to show you a video in a minute because maybe the way I explain is not so clear. So, but literally this is what is the most important part of our ear, which is in the cochlea, which is the hair cells. Because these hair cells, when it dies, it will never, never ever come back. Okay? So this is your asset. This is the asset that we want to take care of as much as possible. We are born with 30,000 30, of it. But of course, through wear and tear, we will lose it. The more wear and tear that goes through it, the more it will die. So I'll show you a video that explains how it moves. <laughs> okay, get ready to dance with the hair cell. <sighs> So, the hair cells will continue dancing until the music stops. So, can you imagine the more energy these hair cells have to move, obviously it will die. On the occupational health kind of uh, section, we will call it uh, when you are overexposed to it more than it should be, it will, call, it will be called a temporary threshold shift. You will lose it temporary and you will have that ringing sound. That is just telling you that you've overused it and then it'll come back. But over time, from temporary hearing loss, it will become a permanent hearing loss, okay? For those who have yet to do your hearing assessments, let's do a little bit of a test, okay? I normally do this for children, but let's just become children today, okay? All right, so are you guys ready? All right. Get the book at asapscience.com. As we grow older, we often lose the extreme ends of our hearing spectrum. So how many of the following sounds can you hear? Okay, get ready, how everybody. How are your ears? Okay, if you can hear 8,000 hertz, you're both alive and not hearing impaired. But let's keep raising the frequency. Good. Anybody can hear? Yes? I can still hear it. Starting to lose it. And yep. Who else here can hear that? <laughs> How high could you hear? If you could hear all of those frequencies, you're probably under 20 years old, but that won't last forever. Unlike other organs such as the liver or skin, the inner ear does not have the capacity to regenerate. In your ear, there are thousands of tiny nerve cells called hair cells. These are responsible for picking up different frequencies and sending the signal to the brain where it's processed. But as you age, the continual exposure to noise and loud sounds can break, bend, and destroy these cells. So why do the high frequencies go first? It turns out that the hairs tuned to high pitches are the first to encounter sound waves. As a result, they experience more stress and tend to degenerate earlier, which is why the older you are, the harder it is to hear high pitches. Got a burning question you want in? Okay, so how was that? That was That's a very quick hearing test. So that's just te checking your frequency. So we can hear from 20 hertz up to 20,000 hits. So that's how big our hearing range is, uh, you know, are. And uh, obviously we start losing the higher frequency first because if we look at the cochlea, which is like a snail shape, if I can go back to this slide over here. So it is a snail shape, right? The most exposed side is actually the high frequency. So because due to wear and tear, they die first. But we all speak English, right? And plural will, ne will need S. So obviously, the, the letter S. So obviously, imagine if you lose the high frequency. So high frequency are sh sh So you will start, obviously, not hearing the sh sh And when we talk about like musician, musical instruments, like violin and whatnot, those strings are mostly in the higher frequencies. So hence, that's why it's so important to know this, because then you know how important your assets are. Okay? So now, when we, okay, we have four parts of, 
our ear, right? So I hope you will remember this. We have the outer ear, we have the middle ear, the inner ear, and the central part of the brain, which is the auditory cortex. I hope this is not too heavy for you guys. So when someone has any kind of hearing impairment at any side of this these places. So let's say when the person has um, earwax, which majority of us will go through once in a while, right? So that's considered as a conductive hearing loss. A conductive hearing loss means a, there's a traffic jam. So that means there's something stuck for you to get to our main asset, the first asset, which is our door, which is the cochlea. So we have a conductive element. For anybody who has any kind of conductive issues, normally an ENT specialist will be able to help you. For instance, you have earwax, then we can remove the earwax. If you have in ear, ear infection, which is situated outer ear or the middle ear, we can take antibiotics to help you to get through it and obviously you get better. And um, sometimes if you have children, some uh, uh, cheeky children will put some, I don't know, Lego in their ear and whatnot. So those are the things that, uh, again, audiologists don't really do all this uh, removals, but normally ENT will do the removals. Okay, so that's considered as conductive hearing loss. If you have a conductive hearing loss, fix it quickly because when you leave it too long, you can have auditory processing disorder. Okay, meaning your brain will not, when, when your brain don't get enough information, it will start to process things slowly, auditorily. Okay, uh, but this is mostly for children. Uh, but adults will also go through it, which I will explain slightly later on the central loss. Okay, so any kind of issues that, you know, you can remove uh, and it's situated at the outer ear or the middle ear is considered as a conductive element. Now, the main part where we don't want to have issues are at the inner ear, which is where our main organ is situated, which is our cochlea. So our cochlea, when, when you lose your outer hair cells or the inner hair cells, it's considered as a sensory neural hearing loss. And that is a permanent hearing loss. And um, we'll, we'll go through how can someone have a permanent hearing loss in a minute. But sensory neural hearing loss is something that you cannot reverse back. When you have a hearing loss that is sensory neural, the only, the only way you can help yourself to continue hearing is either by hearing aids or cochlear implant. All right, so that is where uh, the hearing impairment becomes serious. And of course, it becomes even more serious if it's central deafness or central loss. So that means your brain is unable to process sound. Do you know that from overexposure of sound can also cause the neural damage of your in your brain for you to process sound? So any losses at the inner ear or the uh, or, or the central part is actually quite detrimental for all of us, especially music lovers like us and music producers like us. If the inner ear has issues, you can use hearing aids, you can use cochlear implant. However, if the brain is the issue, unfortunately, there's pretty much nothing much you can do other than just rehabilitation, and that takes a bit of a time. So again, sound, uh, this is our ear structure. The sound goes through the ear, outer ear, middle, inner ear, sorry, outer ear, inner, middle ear, inner ear, and to the brain, okay? And our um, auditory part of the brain is actually mainly on the right side, which is the um, Broca and Wernicke's area, all right? Okay, so how can our hair cells die or how can we really, um, how can we damage our hearing? So it's pretty obvious. Um, recreational noises, aging, um, hereditary, occupational noises, uh, light noise, um, some medications as well, and some illnesses. For, for music lovers, for, for engineers, sound engineers, anytime you take any kind of medication, you must check what is the repercussion. Things that you want to avoid are like um, gentamicin, antibiotics, that, uh, some antibiotics like gentamicin. So gentamicin is for people who has TB. So in Malaysia, they still prescribe gentamicin, okay? So make sure you know. And then um, quinine, chloroquinine. In the earlier uh, intervention for COVID-19, they do give out um, anti-malarial, which is actually chloroquinine, and that causes hearing impairment. And um, when, we, when we talk about drugs, right, it attacks different parts of our ear, meaning different sides of the spectrum of frequency. For instance, uh, gentamicin except, um, attacks the high frequency and chloroquine affects the lower frequency. So it is very important that you know what you take. Sometimes too much aspirin can also cause hearing impairment. 
Okay, so all of these things you need to know. Just make sure that before you take any medication, check what's the repercussion. Okay, so that is um, drugs. Um, sometimes occupational, I don't know, like people who do a lot of cleaning, some of those um, liquid, when you smell it, it will go into your uh, blood. I can't remember the name, can also cause hearing impairment. The things that are quite obvious is obviously noise exposure. Um, aging, we all will lose our hearing due to age. But if you work in a noisy environment, you will have, a quicker hearing impairment because if you don't protect it, okay? Um, some illnesses such as, of course, uh, infections um, like uh, meningitis, COVID-19, if you have, uh, if someone has tumor, that can cause hearing impairment as well, okay? So the risk factors are a lot, but of course, prevention is always better than cure. We, let, we will go through that, don't worry, okay? So again, the door, ear is actually the door for the brain. So a dory for the brain. If we talk about children, obviously, um, they need to be able to hear for them to actually have any kind of speech. Rubbish in, rubbish out. Good information in, good information out. So that's how important hearing is for children. Okay? And... Um, and because um, children, obviously, um, for education, communication, social skills, and learning, that's how important it is. But for adults, the three main effects with hearing impairment is obviously um, hearing impairment causes dementia. 10% is, it causes, causes dementia. Social isolation, of course, speech and language um, processing delay. So um, auditory processing uh, disorder is also one of the effects of not being able to hear. Therefore, that's why as um, some elderly people elderly people when you shout at them you feel like oh why are you why are you shouting and if it's when you speak um when you speak fast they cannot they cannot digest and of course if you speak softly they cannot hear you because of the hearing impairment so there's just a lot of um effects of hearing impairment um with regards to social um communication and and whatnot all right so other, other psychological effects is depression anxiety um you know you, you feel angry or like you have false sense of people being angry at you and all of these psychological effects like i said will uh, result in in social isolation so if um if you know any of your friends are going through that direction you want them to check their hearing first okay all right so um what you can do as a musician as a audio engineers uh, and anyone uh, who obviously uh, who works in the world of music or in the world of sound I would recommend to know your hearing before you actually start working. So in a lot of places, like who, people who work in um, oil and gas, people who work in any kind of factory settings, they are recommended. And no, they're not right. Not just recommended. It is, um, it is a kawajipan. What is it in English? It is a must for you to actually do your hearing. You need to know your baseline. So for you all here, if you are on, uh, if you are working as a freelancer, please do your hearing test. Just get your baseline so you know where you're at. And then every year, check your hearing. And, and for me, uh, for all of you here, and if you are a member of AES, um, for ear to state, you can just come and do your hearing test. We allow you to do it for free. We only charge you if you have, if you guys have any other, like if you want to buy whatever. But um, this is my way of giving back to society. You guys can come and just come and check your hearing. If it's a screening, it's free. So just come and check your hearing. But know your baseline. When you know where you're at, then you know after that is it is my hearing is caused by whatever. Then you must you can know. Okay. All right, so we do newborn hearing screenings. I'm going to go quickly. So um, every age is tested differently, okay? So we have when, you are, when someone's born, uh, we do a screening AABR or AE. It's just a test where you don't have to ask them to press the button. As you, um, if for all of you who have had hearing assessment done, you know that um, the test goes pretty easily. Uh, you're going to have to go through all the frequencies from low frequencies to high frequency, blah, 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 blah. And then at every frequency, we need to know what is the softest sound that you can hear at every frequency. Okay. But like I said, our hearing is from 20 hertz up to 20,000 hertz. But when we perform hearing assessment, it only covers from 500 hertz up until 8,000 hertz. Why? 
because this is a speed range. And if we have to do all the range, I don't know when we will ever go, we will go home <laughs> if we can finish all our patients. So, but for music, for, for all of you, if you want to know, there is an extensive uh, extension uh, hearing assessment, but you're going to have to make sure that the hear, the, the audiometer is uh, calibrated up to 20,000 hertz. Because normally, uh, audiometers are only calibrated up to 8,000 hertz. So just so you know, before you go into it, just ask them, uh, is this audiometer actually calibrated? So all of this you need to know, okay? All right, so coming back to the hearing assessment, um, the, the most, the, the best is when you, when uh, the typical test, which is the pure tone audiometry, where you put the headphones on the ear and the audiologist will ask you, okay, every time you hear the beep, you press the button. So that is the simplest way. Why? Uh, it is simple, but it tells us everything, meaning it is assessing the pure tone, not speech, yeah? Speech is a complex tone. It's a complex signal. I'm sure you guys all know this, but I'm just saying when we do hearing assessment, it's pure tone. But it gives us an idea of every frequency, what is your threshold from low, from 500 hertz up until 8,000 hertz, okay? So again, it goes from outer ear, middle ear, inner ear to the central part. So that's why it's the best, even though it's the easiest. But... For babies, they can't really tell you, okay, I can hear, I'm going to press the button. No, okay, that's, that doesn't work, isn't it? And it goes the same way for children with autism and adults with dementia. So we have other ways of assessing. For babies, when they are born, they will do a hearing screening called AABR and OAE, which is uh, auditory brainstem. It goes through the brainstem. If you see the wave, then okay, hearing is fine. Okay, so... All of you here, please make sure that if you have a baby or your family has um, um, ha has the delivered new babies, just make sure they do a hearing screening. It is a must now in Malaysia, but there are still some hospitals don't do it. Okay, um, I don't, I'm not so sure about Philippines, but I'm pretty sure almost all of our Asian countries have now have gotten um, newborn hearing screening. And of course, as the child grows older, the assessment becomes more of like an adult type. So. Of course, uh, we will start with otoscopic examination where we see your ears and then we will have a middle ear test. Um, this is the middle ear test. So this is a hearing assessment. Uh, this is the tympanometry where we want to see the outer ear from outside top, up, up until the uh, eardrums. And then you want to check whether the eardrums are working fine. We use a tympanometer. Uh, we will do a tympanometry. <clears throat> that's just to check whether there's fluid behind the eardrums or if there's any other issues that's probably uh, blocking the sound to come through. Okay, and then this is OAE as well. OAE is also another test, uh, which is where the, the adult or the child doesn't have to do anything. So if we have people who are malingering or lying, we normally do this because you cannot lie. This is a, an objective test. Okay, so we also have our brain, um, auditory brainstem response where we put like electrodes and whatnot so again this is for children and for um uh, bigger children with autism and for sometimes uh, adults with dementia just cannot give back information so these are all um automated tests and then we have behavior where it slowly becomes adult kind of like hearing assessment okay so finally for us adults so we all do um, and the normal audiometry assessment, like I said, in typical, sorry, from 250 hertz up until 8,000 hertz. So this is the frequency that we will cover. And of course, we will cover uh, the quietest sound that we can test is actually negative 10 up until um, about 110 decibel. Okay, so obviously, I'm pretty sure everybody knows uh, we uh, measure sound through decibel. But of course, when you do hearing assessment, it's the decibel hearing level. And of course, when you talk about environment, is DBA. And um, the whole idea of performing hearing assessment is to know your uh, thresholds, the type of hearing loss. I've already showed you guys the differences where we have conductive. Is it conductive? Is it centenural? Or is it the brain type? And you also need to know your audio, uh, dynamic range. Okay, If you don't know what dynamic range of hearing means, how loud can you handle? And how soft can you handle? So normally... Our uh, normal hearing should be from. Sorry, this is not. Um, this is not his hearing loss. Yeah, this is just a picture and a, a picture of an audio 
audiogram, just in case if you know who this is. Okay, all right. So having said that, um, the dynamic range of our hearing, uh, uh, a normal person should be able to hear from uh, normal hearings between negative 10 to 20 at any frequencies. And um, the, the loudest you can handle is about 90 to 100 decibel. That is a comfortable range. So we call that a dynamic range. But as, we, as the outer hair cells dies, your uh, your threshold will probably go down here and your um, your tolerance to loud sound will also go probably up here. So your dynamic range becomes smaller. That's when I said that some elderly, when you talk softly, they cannot hear you. But when you shout at them, they will say, why are you shouting? Because their dynamic range is very small. Okay, so that's where and normally we, we will give hearing aids where it will digitalize every sound that comes through. So it gives comfort, it gives clarity as much as possible. But just so you know, you lot will be the hardest to actually please because you know audio too well. You know how to hear too well. So from my experience, uh, if there's an audio engineering in the house, like, oh my God, it's probably the probably my, my most nervous uh, kind of patient. So just so you know, okay? Uh, please make our life easier, okay? Anyway, having said that, that is dynamic range. So, um, but not a lot of people do that kind of um, assessment, but you must know that that's available. So when you want to do perform hearing assessment, you want to know the threshold, type, level, and dynamic range, ideally. Okay, so these are the types of um, intervention or type of hearing devices that we will give to patients who has hearing impairment. We have the hearing aids, we have obviously colorful for children, we have the cochlear implant, we have the body wands um, and others. All right, so this is uh, every hearing aids are now digitalized. Um, everything is connected to our phone and it's all Bluetooth. So um, it is, it can be tinier, but I promise you that Right now, I would if I have a hearing impairment, I would go the ones behind the ear and the very tiny tube uh, that goes inside the ear. So this would be my recommendation because it's easy. It's um, hearing aids are not cheap. Yeah, hearing it is from anybody know anybody here knows how much is the hearing aid. No, okay. no idea. Anyone? Anyone nope. knows how much is the hearing aid? Nope. Sorry. One thousand. <laughs> One thousand. <Never>. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> You must know this, okay? All right, so I'm going to share with you in a minute. Okay, 2,000, 3,000, okay. Generally, how long does it take before temperature threshold shift kicks in and at the what level? Okay, wait. All right, okay. So let me answer that question first, all right? Hearing aid can cost uh, from 1,008, one side, up to, uh, to 16,000 ringgit on one side. And seriously, being an audio engineer, you guys who want to have the crisp sound ever and you and that means you want the 16,000 hearing aids I'm just sharing with you that's how that's the market price right now and because musicians uh there is a um in hearing aids we have a lot of um um features and one of the features are musicians features music for you to enjoy music because hearing aids are made for speech they're not made for you to enjoy music so for you to be able to enjoy music, that means we have to open up a lot of things. So that means the hearing it has to have a lot of range. So hearing it only goes up to probably, I think the highest frequency I heard is about 12,000 12, hertz. So again, you're going to lose all the beautiful melodies. Or you will lose all the sound of violin and whatnot. So again, having said that, just so you know, this is how hearing aid is, yeah? Okay, so there's other uh, accessories that comes with hearing aids. Um, and um, maybe if I, uh, if I want to know more about Telecoil system, because uh, Telecoil system is not really famous in Malaysia, but any other parts in the Europe is very famous because uh, people with hearing impairment uh, wears, who wears hearing aids, normally um, it's mandatory for big um, like musical theater, any kind of like um, places where a lot of people will go, they will have to put this telecall system. Okay, so the telecall system as, uh, allows hearing aid users to switch on to telecall system. So whatever that the person, okay, let's take an example. In the UK, majority of the churches would have telecall system. So whatever, uh, whatever the priest speaks from the mic, it goes directly to the hearing aids as long as they switch on the telecall system. Okay, so we also do call telecall system. So if you have any question, I can talk to you guys about telecall system. But that's, I'm um, just sharing with you, these are the things that are available in the world of audiology and a world of hearing. So it's not the end of the world when someone has a hearing impairment, but it's a lot of money to spend. 
Okay? Alright, so this is the best part. Okay, protecting your musical future. Okay, so I'm very passionate about uh, prevention. So we've talked about uh, we've talked about how hearing start, I mean how the hearing pretty much works, how it looks like, how the sun comes through and, and how the sun is processed. Um, I'm very sorry if I'm very quick, but I would like to cover a lot of things today. So uh, if you have any questions, then you can ask me in a minute. Yeah. So we've covered all of that and we've also covered um, uh, what happens if you have a hearing impairment. Now let's talk about prevention. Uh, protecting your musical future is definitely protecting your hearing. So you want to be able to protect it when you are doing your performance, when you're doing your mixing, when you're doing your practice, when you're rehearsing, because you want to definitely have your hearing till the end of your life, right? So any kind of loud sound can cause irreversible damage. And I think I've already showed you. What I didn't show you is how the damage has a looks like. I don't know why it's not in my presentation. Not to scare you, but just to, you know, just get you guys to see how it looks like. Having said that, once you have a hearing impairment, once you lose your outer hair cells, there's no way for you to get it back, unfortunately. But if you don't remember whatever that I have shared today, but this is one most important thing that I would love you guys please remember if you suddenly lost your hearing you have 72 hours to kind of like um you know when someone's someone is about to die and they uh, or they lose their heartbeat then you have that do -do 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 thing right <laughs> so you only have to 72 hours to get back your hair cells to uh, uh from like coma to go back alive so uh, normally what ENC specialists will actually do is to give you steroids to, to get back your hearing okay and sometimes infections can cause this over exposure to sound can cause this um, uh, from for instance a traumatic uh, sound um, exposure um, like we had patients who were sitting next to the um, um, alarm and uh, of course is a traumatic experience, right? So you have 72 hours to inject the steroids to get it back alive. But maybe not 100%, but you have a little bit of harapan lah, you know? So a little bit of hope there. So again, uh, that is something that please, if you have a sudden hearing loss, please go straight to the emergency, okay? All right, so next. As I was saying, um, loud sound can cause irreversible damage and you all know that music is not a noise. Music is music. In whatever whatever loudness it is, music is beautiful, right? The louder it is, the more exciting because your heart starts pumping. But you know that when your heart starts pumping, that means your, your outer hair cells are pumping too. Okay, just so you know, yeah? Okay, so again, repeated exposure to loud sounds can cause hearing impairment, a permanent one, and tinnitus. Anybody here has tinnitus by any chance? Or do you know what's a tinnitus? Does anybody here have tinnitus? Or do you know what's a tinnitus? Okay, this is very important. It happens sometimes to me as well. Okay. Uh, okay. As much as you hate to admit it, but... <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so, so tinnitus is a ringing sound or a sound that only you can hear. Nobody else can hear other than yourself. So um, tinnitus... I have tinnitus, I'm afraid. I used to do a lot of performing arts. I used to be a dancer for tourism. So that's why I'm really excited when Mr. Wong was saying like he does all things in IB. Yeah, I kind of grew up in Matic when I was little. So having said that, um, I have tinnitus at the age of 11. Uh, back then, I thought, oh, oh, I think if I can hear, everybody also have the same problem. But no, actually, for only people who have exposed to loud sounds can cause tinnitus. About 95% um, of people with tinnitus are people who have hearing impairment. It might not be inside the audiogram, which is in the speech range, which is from 250 up to 8,000 hertz. It's probably beyond that. So I've done my hearing test, obviously, being an audiologist. So mine is about 15,000 hertz, 12,000 hertz. Um, yeah. If I don't take care of my hearing, I'll be definitely using hearing aids when I'm older, which I, you know, I'm pretty much conditioning my brain already by now. Anyway, having said that, musicians' earplugs are something that you need to have. Everyone in this room must have a music musician's earplugs, and I'll share with you how it looks like and musicians earplugs are definitely made for musicians because it attenuates the sound but allows you to hear the acoustics that you actually need to hear okay so it's now you were asking how loud is loud what kind of loud is loud all right so safe sounds are anything below 80 db all right so how do you want to know uh download sound level meter in your phone okay just download it and um 
pretty much you will know if you're in one uh, with that. Uh, I think nowadays even Apple phone can actually measure sound. So um, everyone should get that. Yay. And 85 decibel or 85 dBA is considered as dangerous decibel. Unfortunately, majority of our sounds are above 85 dBA. So, but it's okay as long as you know how long are you meant to expose to these sounds. Now, 85 dBA is about eight hours. And the, and the hours gets lesser and lesser as it goes higher. So as you can see, at 100 dBA is only 14 minutes, uh, 110 dBA is only two minutes. And let's have a look at our music. So again, this is how um, um, this is how you protect your ears. Other than wearing um, earplugs, you need to turn it down if you can. So this is for general people. <laughs> and if you're outside, when you're not being, a, a, being an audio engineer, uh, turn it down, protect your ears, and try to walk away, okay? So again, as I was saying, this is for everyday, everyday sound. So 85 dB is actually the busy city's traffic. And then uh, the gas more or the hair dries at 95, and then 105, uh, the Walkman, Walkman? <laughs> this is like 20 years ago. Ambulance is about 125, so it gets loud. These are things that we normally hear every day. But this is the sound of all musical instruments. And unfortunately, it is quite loud. Majority of our sounds are very loud. And I'm pretty sure all of you don't just use one sound. You pretty much use all of these sounds to make a beautiful song, right? Or a beautiful piece. So just so you know, protect your ears as much as possible because your asset is your hearing, right? So again, uh, just to remind you, a beautiful sound, a beautiful sound comes from a very healthy hearing, okay? So again, you must know this, and these are types of musician earplugs that's available in the market. You have the ones, they're not custom, so obviously one size fits all. So this is from Fonak. Uh, we have this, we have a lot of different brands uh, for musicians earplugs. Uh, and we also have the new custom mates, for instance, like Style Sonic. They also have those, um, wait, not Style Sonic, some other brands also can do custom made. So if you are like me, I can't just pretty, I can't use the typical ones. I have to custom made. So you can use the custom made ones. So they will have good filters for you um, to protect your ears. So let me just get you to see this quickly. Good job. Yeah. Okay, so these are the things, this is the differences when you actually use it and without using it. So without the protection. Okay, so that's without protection. Obviously with the foam earplugs. It attenuates literally everything. So with the tube filter. Slightly better. So obviously with the more changi version of earplugs, it gets better lah, kan? So yeah. Okay, so those are the types of um, earplugs that you can actually um, use, um, which is the musician's earplugs specifically. So coming back to the um, other kinds of things that you will be exposed, of course, in the ear monitor. So in the ear monitor, you, there's a lot of brands available out there. So the one that I'm having on this uh, display right now is called the Stealth Sonic, which ones that we are working on or working with. So again, why do we want to use um, um, in the ear monitors? Obviously, for right now, obviously there's not much of a performance going on. However, um, we need to, I mean, the usage of ear, um, in the ear monitors will obviously, the right usage will definitely turn down the environmental sound, which will definitely protect your ears. And when you can hear things clearly, you don't need to pump out sounds more than you need. Okay, so again, in the ears, in the ear monitors are good. Obviously, there are other ones. Um, and there's a lot of brands in the market, um, but the one that I'm sharing right now is called Self Sun. All right. So now we're going to talk a little bit about tinnitus. Overexposure to sound can also cause tinnitus. So um, I'm certified um, dangerous decibel. Um, normally, I take I, the whole idea of taking dangerous decibel is to help the younger generation to take care of the hearing 
of their hearing because uh, WHO has um, come up with a statement that young, more younger generations now suffer from hearing impairment because of recreational usage, um, like um, using iPods and I, iPods and other kind of like devices. So, um, as I was saying, um, as I was saying before, overexposure to loud sounds can cause hearing impairment, which is a permanent hearing impairment, and tinnitus. So, what is tinnitus? Tinnitus is again. Um, only any kind of sound that you hear, it can be a ringing sound, it can be a roaring sound, it can be a shushing noise, anything, any kind of sound, but only you can hear. There's two types of uh, tinnitus. One is called the objective, one is called the subjective. So the typical ones uh, is called the subjective ones, uh, which is the normal uh, ringing in the ear. And the objective ones, if you hear uh, uh, your heart beat, the sound of your heartbeat. So that's something that is not related to noise exposure. That is to do with your blood circulation. And that, if that's a problem, then you need to go and see an ENT and you want to know like if there's any blood circulation issues. Okay. All right. So again, causes of uh, tinnitus, there's a lot, um, but majority of the cases, people with uh, tinnitus are due to hearing impairment, 95%. There will be people who have tinnitus because of other issues that goes along the auditory pathway. Maybe uh, the chemical is imbalanced or some nerve um, are overexciting and, and whatnot. But these are the causes. Um, hypertension, smoking, noise exposure, of course, um, anxiety, um, hearing loss, uh, like I said, and um, generational differences. What does that mean? Anyway, having said that, these are red flags uh, for you guys to know. Uh, if you suddenly have a sudden onset of tinnitus, you must go and check straight away to your ENT specialist. Um, again, a uh, sudden onset of hearing loss and tinnitus also go straight away to see your ENT or audiologist. Again, a unilateral tinnitus, also you need to see a, a, a it is a red flag because that could call, that could tell you so many other things. Um, a parcel tinnitus, like I said, like a thumping noise, like a pop, like pulse. You need to go and check as well. So all of this information is very important uh, for you to know to differentiate whether you are now your ears are telling you that um, sorry, I think you start to damage some of your hearing hair cells, or um, there's other things that you need to know. Okay, as I was saying. Um, prevention of hearing impairment, hearing impairment is not just about things that comes through, it's also things that you eat. So um, how do you prevent hearing impairment or damage of your hair cells? You can eat well. So eating well, such as um, food with a lot of uh, vitamin B, vitamin B is very important uh, for you to maintain your uh, nerve um, activities. And um, iron, magnesium, potassium, and zinc is very important. Now, magnesium is very good for your nerves as well. Um, potassium uh, is actually sodium and potassium are both equally important, but majority of our food has a lot of um, uh, sodium. So the fluid that flows in our cochlea is actually sodium and potassium. That's why potassium is very important. Okay, And then um, iron is for the blood. And of course, zinc is for immune system. So a lot of a lot of these um, um, nutritions that you can get from fruits, some magnesium specifically for ears is magnesium oxide. So if you can get hold of magnesium oxide, get hold of it and take it. Uh, I think after the age of thirty, you will start depleting that, and that's where you want to start taking it. And especially for us, music, uh, for uh, audio engineers, I would recommend it to preserve your hearing as much as possible or preserve the ear structures as much as possible. High in protein, low in fat, definitely. High in uh, anti-inflammatory or antivirals, I would say, and high in antioxidant fruits. Antioxidant foods is very important. If you've just gone to a concert or you've just gone on a very loud geek, straight away eat something with high antioxidants because when you are exposed to loud sounds, it um, it pretty much exudes a lot of uh, the, um, how do I say this? Um, can't remember, I can't recall the name, but point is- To get rid of the free radicals, you mean? 
Yes, thank you so much. Free radicals, that's the word. Thank you, Dave. You saved my life today. So again, uh, the free radicals, when you are exposed to loud sounds, you will exude free radicals. So um, the antioxidants, take it as soon as possible so that you can obviously uh, maintain your um, hearing as much as possible. Case, of course, um, and saturated fat, all these things will just, uh, will not allow uh, the blood to flow to your uh, ear as much as it should come okay all right so i think i'm uh at my end of my session today um in a nutshell to make good music you need to have good hearing you need to protect your hearing in any means and protect it holistically and not just uh, protecting your ears with hearing uh, with earplugs um, of course um, you want to obviously eat well you protect from the inner and the outer I'm very, because um, I'm very into nutrition. So therefore, it's very important that we look at ourselves holistically. Okay. All right. So again, prevention is better than rehabilitation. Why I say rehabilitation? Because there's no cure. If you have hearing impairment, it is a permanent hearing loss. Yeah. So uh, again, prevention is better than rehabilitation. Hearing aids are very expensive. Although if you, if anyone has hearing aids, I'll be very rich, but that's not the point here today. <laughs> so my point here today is definitely prevention is better than for rehabilitation. And, um, uh, definitely hearing intervention is the key to maintaining auditory processing. So auditory processing is very important. We want to be able to compute whatever communication that we have with our peers. Nowadays, it's even more imperative because we use a lot of digital communication. We use Zoom, we use all this, all of this technology to keep us sane, right? And for you guys, uh, definitely, um, you work with a lot of machines, a lot of technology. So you want to make sure that um, your brain continues to work. So if you start feeling that, I think I might have a bit of a hearing impairment, go and check. Like I said, get yourself a baseline. Like I said, you are all welcome to come to Eartistic. We do it for free for all uh, AS members. In fact, we are we have, we have gone on this musicians. Um, anyone who's a musician who is um, uh, registered with Cineman, uh, you get free hearing assessment because kita jaga kita, right? So there's no. I understand how um, the support that musicians, um, artists. And I'm not so, so sure. I just asked JD, how are you all protected? How are you all um, taken care of? Because I work with a lot of occupational health sectors. So um, a lot of people are protected because they work in, uh, they work in uh, factories, but that's not, I wouldn't say that's not your asset. Hearing is everybody's asset. But for audio engineers and musicians, that's like, if you can insure something in your body, I'm pretty sure you want to insure your ears. Because I would do that. Right. So again, um, you want to maintain your auditory processing. You don't want to go to the root of depression or dementia because especially musicians, um, you live with music. Your life is music. And when you don't have your music, what else do you, you, you will feel lost? Because I would feel that way because I grew up with music. I've always wanted to be Mariah Carey, but I know my limitations. Therefore, yeah, so I mean, I'm happy to be Shasa Aziz. Um, but I'm, I'm just saying here that's really important for everyone to know from every angle. Again, take care of your hearing um, holistically. And if you have a problem, just get hold of the nearest audiologist that you know. I think that's all for me. And I hope you, it wasn't too quick. Uh, I haven't touched uh, vertigo, which I'm pretty sure you guys don't, probably don't want to know. Uh, just so you know, if you feel dizzy when you hear sound, it's called Tullio's Phenomenon. Tullio's Phenomenon is telling you that one of, uh, because if you were to look at your ear, oh, sorry, if you look at your ear um, structure, so I'm not going to take too much of your time, but this is my, my last but not least. Vertigo is my favorite part. That's my genre, actually. That's my real focus and cochlear implant. So, okay, so we have the, okay, so this is our cochlea, which is cochlea, cochlea is a brand, this is our cochlea, which is our hearing organ, and we also have these three little semicircular canals, and this part is also in the inner ear, so if someone has infection, any part or anywhere, sometimes they will also have dizziness, okay, so because they say, they say in the same house. So in our ear, we have the hearing organ and also our balance organ. Now, if some, if you, if someone has um, dizzy spells when there's too loud sounds, when the sounds too loud, it's called to lose phenomenon. That also means there's a 
there's some sort of concussion here. Okay, because this is obviously your balance system and, um, and, and it just tells us that there's something wrong with your vestibular system. Okay, so I hope everybody kind of like got all the important information that I would love to share. And I now will open the floor to questions. All right, that is awesome. All right, thank you so much, doctor, for right, running us through you know, all these questions. Um, we'll get into the Q&A right now. We've got a bunch of questions, right? Uh, just to pick up from where you left off, um, you mentioned about things such as um, social security and uh, especially those um, who are, you know, working in factories, oil and gas. For a lot of, a lot of people, um, when they are health issues, it's covered by things such as social security and insurance. What about hearing? What sort of protections do, do we have? In Malaysia? Well, yeah, I suppose I can, in the context of, yeah, if you can speak to what, what's in Malaysia. La. I can also share a bit of international as well, because mm. um, obviously I worked in the NHS in the UK. Right, right. And, um, uh, and also I kind of have friends uh, in the US as well. So um, a major, if you want to take insurance, take the international insurance, the one that covers hearing straight away. Now mm -hmm. you can get it because I had patients uh, who was uh, covered for cochlear implant and that is a cochlear. Okay. I shared with you guys how much the, the, the how much is hearing needs, right? Cochlear implants on one side is hundred thousand. Yeah. Uh, okay. So that's, that's how much intervention of hearing impairment is expensive, right? So cause, uh, so um, first of all, I'll talk about insurance. So insurance in the U S you are, very much covered uh, for hearing aids. Uh, of course, if, if you're a veteran and whatnot, you are also covered. In the UK, the NHS covers everyone, literally. In Malaysia, for so, for, if you work with um, government, JPA will cover. If you are a veteran, you will be covered. If you are uh, working in um, a private sector and you pay, the company pays SOXO, you are also covered by PKSO. So uh, we are also panel to Picasso. So obviously, um, I don't see a lot of musicians. Mm. Uh, I see a lot of people from oil and gas, a lot of people from um, any other industry, but not musicians. So that's why I feel it's so important that all of you must be part of SOXO programs mm -hmm. because this is considered as occupational hazards, right? So um, that is covered. Um, but insurance, there's rarely any coverage in Malaysia. So just so you know, take international uh, coverage. Um, I will try my best to find out what's the, what's the name of the uh, insurance. I'll share with you, JD, because mm -hmm. that's the only one that I, I knew of. And that is like a, uh, because this, this family is a royalty. So they obviously go for a bigger, whatever bigger that they can get. Right. So, but for us, we'll, let's, Let's take that one if that's if we can afford it, right? So right. that is something that I would encourage. But uh, other than that, um, if you're not in government, if you're not uh, mm -hmm. under any other um, uh, schemes, then you probably not be covered. Okay, uh, let's get to another question. This is from Yogi, right? Uh, Yogi, be shout out to you, man. We on the question of drugs, uh, aspirin. Actually, it's quite surprising to me. I still wasn't aware aspirin can cause um, hearing loss. How much? What? What's the dosage? How much of aspirin cause and uh, how long is does does it affect for a certain duration? Okay, I have to go back because it's been a long mm. time since I checked it out. But mm. I know aspirin, a long use, long term usage of aspirin can cause tinnitus, so it pretty much affects the hair cells. Um, there is an uh, hold on, huh? aspirin and hearing loss. Uh, aspirin overdose and hearing loss. Yes. Mm -hmm. Over usage of it can cause hearing impairment. Again, I'm not so I, I don't have the amount that uh, uh, tells me the usage, how long it is. But I'll get back to you, JD. Okay. But definitely, if you just Google aspirin overdose and hearing loss, it will tell you all about it. And um, yeah, it causes hearing impairment, which is like I said, it can cause multi moderate sensory neural hearing loss mm -hmm. and tinnitus. I didn't share with you the level of hearing impairment. So just so you know, a normal hearing is from negative ten to twenty normal hearing and then uh 20 to 40 decibels considered as mild 40 to 70 is considered as moderate hearing impairment mm -hmm. 70 to 90 is severe 90 and above is considered as profound hearing impairment seriously you don't want to get there 
Yeah, definitely but, but normally not. we will lose in the higher frequency can also go down there is like no one I want to bump down to the highest um, in the uh, higher frequency up to profound level because of overexposure the first frequency that will die first from noise is actually uh, 4,000 to 6,000 hertz so when you perform hearing assessment you will see like oh good 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 bump and it goes better that's a sign of noise induced hearing loss so like I said, go and check your hearing. So there was a question also about the hearing aids, mm -hmm. right? Because when we were guessing <clears throat> the prices, mm -hmm. um, is there any reason why there's, there are those that price from around 1,000 ringgit to 16,000 ringgit? That's like 10 times the price. Yes, so what you're buying yeah. is actually technology. What you're buying is features. So the cheaper the hearing aid is, that means the lesser technology you have. If you don't really require to hear a lot, so for instance, let's take a person who the, their daily activities are just going to work, come back to work, watch TV, and then sleep. That's all. I only need my hearing for uh, conversation. All right, so they can they can get away with that, and they don't like uh, they don't go playing they go they don't go outside to play golf because when you want to hear when you are what things that comes through our ears there's wind there's noise there's human conversation and of course when you were hearing it you want to have a conversation that's the main point of hearing aids right so the more features you need that means the more features you need to to uh, to eliminate noise to eliminate wind to eliminate I don't know whatever thing then that means you need to buy more technology and it's a lot of a um, lot of research done therefore that's why uh, it's expensive I don't think the things are cheap is expensive but I think the research is expensive because hearing aid changes like iPhones every six months there's always something new so but don't wait until they have like whatever latest latest just get it if you have it or if you know anyone has it get it because the later you wear hearing aids the brain will start slowing down but having said that, that's why the big range of sound. And normally, if you get it from the government, it's normally the cheap ones, of course, the middle range to the very cheap ones, depending on if, let's say, JKM. Let's say you um, register, if the person registers themselves as OKU, so of course they get uh, from JKM. However, JKM is, our, is the uh, Jabatan Kebajikan. It's the Malaysian, the welfare department. Eh? Just, just, right. for, just for the benefit of our uh, oh, yeah, viewers. So cool. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I'm so sorry. So uh, welfare department, basically. Yeah, welfare yeah. department. Mm. So it's normally a very, uh, the hearing aids are cheap. Um, and of course, it has the very lower spec of, um, lower spec of uh, coverage of technology. Therefore, a lot of people who get free hearing aids end up putting it in the, put it in the, you know, in the kota, in the end. Mm. Uh, but I know for a fact that hearing aids in Philippines are very expensive. That one for sure, because I had a patient who, um, a Malaysian who lives in the in the Philippines, um, they had to come back to Malaysia because it's cheaper to handle it in Malaysia for some reason. So I'm, I'm not so sure, but that's what I got from my patient. So yeah, so that's the reason why why hearing aids are very very different in terms of pricing. It's the technology that you're buying, and of course nowadays hearing aids are made for iPhones. And it's made for Androids. Are made for um, Internet of Things. So again, um, they just have to run and compete with the rest of the companies. Again, six months, always something new. I so go crazy. Anyway. That is, yeah, that, that is a lot of cutting edge technology there that um, if you dive into it, wow, it's a big rabbit hole to go into. Uh, I've got yeah, a very make your life easy. Yeah, I got a very specific question from uh, uh, Dave, from um, Sir Dave Domingo. Right. Um, I, just in case you, I'll just type it and send it in the chat as well. Uh, he asks, how can you treat, um, I'm not sure whether I'm spelling this correctly, seborrheic dermatitis? Huh? Is that something? Seborrheic your... dermatitis. It is Seborrheic it is, dermatitis. It's a, skin, it's a yes. skin issue, right? Yes. Yeah, so obviously, uh, I'm, not, I'm not an ENT specialist, I'm afraid. So uh, normally, um, if any kind of infection, uh, which is a skin-based, uh, it's normally a antibiotics but like i said um because dermatitis i would assume it's infection so um again i'm not an ent specialist so i can't really comment on that i'm afraid but i'll mm. definitely uh if i get the answers i will remember this question i will mm -hmm. pass it to jd i will ask right. my ent counterparts right so the second question the ear gene ear lotion 
So this is more of an ENT um, special specialty, lah, right? I'm afraid so, yeah. Right. But don't worry, okay. I'll check it out. But thank you for the, that question, Dave. You know, that's a really, really cool, good okay. question. Whatever you do, I mean, like when it comes to, okay, I mean, um, I don't know. I, I think a lot of musicians are um, jack of all trades and I'm not, I'm also one of them. So I love learning about uh, nutrition and skin and beauty and whatnot as much as I can. Um, whatever you do with skin, try to go for something natural. If you have earwax in your ear, the best thing to do is never to put anything in your ear because you're not supposed to put anything in your ear. You're not supposed to even take out your earwax, right? So the best thing for you to use is actually um, olive oil, virgin olive oil specifically. The virgin olive oil is enough for the wax to be absorbed. Uh, the oil is enough for the wax to be absorbed and it will come out by itself. So just so you know, so if you want to get like something for any kind of, inf- if you have any skin, let's say eczema, you want to try to get natural products as much as possible. Mm-hmm. It's a bit running away from the main topic, but um, but at least I'm sharing with you guys the main thing, which is that your ex, virgin olive oil works. It works like magic. Well, oh boy, that, that's good to know. I, I'm very guilty of that, you know, being it's a very Asian culture <laughs> thing, you know, right? <laughs> yeah, because uh, if you, if you uh, accidentally introduces infection then it will come over and over again mm. so d- don't say i didn't tell you yeah so i'm just okay. saying it's very important that you don't put anything in your ear all right other yeah. than your uh, elbow that's what people say <laughs> which you can't really do that can you yes all right that's 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 what i mean it's a rhetorical question good one yeah. good one yeah how many um, drops um one yeah. drop is fine before you sleep just one drop uh depending on how bad your wax is if it's very dry one drop maybe once a month uh, because it's enough for it to actually absorb. But, you know, best is to go and see an audiologist, see how bad it is. And um, uh, But not, like, if you want it quicker, go to see an ENT and they'll just suck it out. All right. Uh, I've got a question from Benjamin Tan. He says, I feel uncomfortable hearing high-frequency pure tones. Okay. Um, so will listening to those damage my hearing, even though it's below 70 dBA? Meaning you feel uncomfortable with high frequency sounds, right? So there's, uh, as, as I was saying, as I was sharing before that we need to know our dynamic range, right? So sometimes some people can have a smaller dynamic range due to outer hair cell loss. Now the outer hair cell loss job is actually to regulate sound. When the sound is too soft, it makes it louder. When the sound is too loud, it makes it softer. So it helps us to hear comfortably in any kind of sound that comes through. It's but like when a you beautiful don't compressor. Have... Exactly. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, so our hearing is that uh, it tries to mimic the outer hair cells mm. to make the sound that comes through comfortable. Yeah, I love talking to you guys. So anyway, having said that, um, as we age and as we kind of damage the outer hair cells, that can happen. It can happen from the dynamic range being smaller, all, although there's another version of could happen as well. It is called hyperacusis. Hyperacusis is when you uh, when you become more sensitive to sound. I'm pretty sure you don't have hyperacusis. Just go yeah. to your hearing test. At least you, you know why. I know of some engineers who are very sensitive at very specific frequencies, like 4.2K to hear like a very very sensitive towards that, you know? So is that- It could also that, be the nerve. Yeah. That, that, that could be the nerve. Like I said, uh, mm. audio engineers are the hardest to please when it comes to hearing aids because you know your sound too well. So yeah, having said that, it could be like uh, your brain is just so tuned to sound that you know, you know, there's just a lot of things for uh, an audio engineers to, <laughs> to, to, to pinpoint. So best is to do your hearing test, know your dynamic range, where, know the frequencies that you feel uncomfortable. And from there, we can assess. Like, for instance, if, you have, if someone has tinnitus, we want to know which frequency is causing that sound. So that's what we do. We do assess on the frequency. And then we also have, um, and what, what can we do from there? How we can we condition so that you don't feel too uncomfortable? So there's a lot of things that we can do um, as an audiologist. Uh, Mike Padero, Mr. Padero from uh, AS Philippines had a question about ear cleaning. But I mm-hmm. think already the question's already been answered, right? About using cotton buds and earbuds. Mm-hmm. Your no, answer was ready. Possible. Yeah. The best is either, um, like I said, olive oil works oh. best. I think uh, Ayat also knows. <laughs> and also, um, you can also use a sodium bicarbonate. Um, that softens the wax and allows the wax to come up by itself. 
Okay, right. So uh, we've got a bunch of questions. Let's go through quickly, right? Because mm -hmm. right, we don't want to keep everyone uh, uh, too long. Uh, what is somatosensory tinnitus? Somatosensory tinnitus. So to, like I said, there's only two types of tinnitus. Mm. There's subjective and uh, object, uh, objective tin, uh, subjective tinnitus is when you can hear or the objective, which is the pulsatile. type. So let me see what that somatosensory means because sometimes it's just, it just has another a version of a name. While you're looking at it, does coffee or other food uh, trigger or affect tinnitus? Yes, definitely. So, mm. okay. Um, again, let me just finish this yes. somatosensory. Yeah. So somatosensory is all about uh, what is somatosensory is actually your body. Right. So it could be like, for instance, if someone has TMJ, uh, temporary mandibular joint issues. So when you open your mouth, you start hearing clicking. Right. So. Um, oh, no, uh, I'm hearing it right now. <laughs> so again, that, that is what somatosensory tinnitus should mean. And mm. somatosensory is pretty much your body. So when we okay. talk about somatosensory, it's also part of information that goes up to your brain to know where you are in space, right? right. So again, uh, that is somatosensory tinnitus and you're going to have to definitely see, um, first see an, uh, an audiologist and then for them, for them, after that, then you go and see an ENT. Okay. All right. So cof coffee or other food that affects tinnitus? Yes. So um, uh, what you want to avoid when you actually have to, if someone has tinnitus, is definitely coffee. Stress makes it louder. Okay, you can have coffee, but just so you know, if you overtake it, you need to know that tinnitus is not a disease. It's a symptom. Because someone, okay, for instance, majority of people have tinnitus because they have a hearing impairment, right? So obviously, you know that it's not detrimental. It's not going to kill you because a lot of people go very stressful because they don't know where the tinnitus come from. Am I going to die because of this sound? So it is just a symptom. Okay, let's talk about nutrition. Now, food. Uh, coffee and uh, alcohol makes it louder. So the more you take, the more your friend will become louder. Uh, so just so you know that, you know, it's not, I'm not dying. It's just that I kind of overtook this uh, coffee. So you should enjoy life. It doesn't cause any damage. However, it will cause the tinnitus louder. If you hate the sound, then obviously that's, I think hate is a bit too much of a word. But if you don't mm. like it, then control the consumption of your uh, coffee and um, coffee and alcohol. Of course, drugs as well. Um, recreational drugs also make it louder. Um, stress makes it louder. Um, sometimes, for some people, post-sex uh, intercourse can also make it louder. Uh, again, um, the blood didn't come to the enough. But when the blood goes somewhere else, that's more important at that time. So you will also lose, you will also sound, the tinnitus becomes louder. Okay, so um, a lot of things uh, to consider. But the main thing is that tinnitus is just a symptom. It won't kill you, but it tells you that something's not right with your auditory, uh, auditory uh, pathway. So again, control coffee, control uh, alcohol, and, and other things that can cause you stress and tired. I think that's a very good point. You mentioned that, that tinnitus is, is not a disease, it's a symptom. It's and, a symptom. And yeah, sometimes I think um, there's a bit of the uh, a stigma or the fear that we want to admit that we have a, a hearing issue, especially when it comes to audio engineers and people who <laughs> work, work in, in music because it can be very devastating to your career. Lah. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Yeah. yeah, I feel you. Uh, yes, agree. I agree with you, Hadi. It's yeah. That's why I'm. I'm. I'm very. When I approach uh, audiology, I look. I look at it holistically. Mm. That's why I now go into nutrition as well. All right. Okay. I think Hadi uh, Iskandar also asked, should you wear musical hearing aids even if you have no hearing damage, or no. will standard IEM earphones? Okay. So yeah. hearing aids are okay for us audiologists. If mm we don't fix what's not broken. So if right. you don't have anything that's broken, don't use any aids, okay? So um, uh, so hearing aids, definitely not, uh, but you use musician's earplugs. You can mm. use, uh, but if you're doing, like I said, in the ear monitors are good because it gives you the clarity of sound. Of course, uh, when we talk about uh, in the ear monitors, the higher the driver, the better for you, right? Because that means you can hear a lot more better depth uh, in terms of sound. So yeah, um, 
yeah, I would I would go for the best driver if you can afford uh, for you to hear well. Um, yes, in ear monitor. Um, and if you have to go for a party, um, definitely uh, ear protection is the key. Um, you can use the typical ones. I mean, the you can obviously it starts from foam. Obviously, that is kind of suck when it comes to like hearing sound nicely. And then of course you've got the the uh, the typical the 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 one size fit all um, earplugs and uh, sound musicians earplugs. And then of course you have the custom. So those are the things that you can choose. All right. Okay. We've got actually still quite a lot of questions. I don't think we'll be able to cover it, but because some of those questions are actually very, very specific to um, some conditions that some, some people are, are experiencing. There's a question about vertigo. There's questions about, um, vertigo. you know, um, there are some, some of some members asked about their personal experiences going to an ENT and, and getting some issues this sort of things, right? Uh, I think it's probably best that, you know, to go and actually go and see an audiologist and do a checkup because, mm-hmm. you know, to try to answer, I'm sure, right, doc, in, to try to answer and to arrive at a diagnosis uh, online <laughs> in doing this meeting is not going to be, not going to be very efficient, not going to be very effective, lah, right? So we got a bunch can, of questions there. Right? I can try and answer as much as possible, yeah. but definitely I would say if you ever have to, mm-hmm. I mean, like if you have the opportunity, go and have a hearing tested and then mm-hmm. you can ask as many questions as possible. And I'm pretty sure audiologists would love to share as much as possible. Yeah, because we have only 15 minutes, maybe we'll just go to one or two more questions. I'll mm-hmm. save all everything in the in the chat. We'll, we'll save it and then I'll yeah, and I can send it to me. You. I can I can definitely try my best to answer as no much as possible. No problem. Okay. Uh ear candling, is it recommended? Definitely not. Definitely not. Okay, definitely yes. Not. Okay. But it's up to you, your ears. But you know, we, like I said, don't put anything in your ear if you don't mm-hmm. have to. All right. Okay. Uh let's see. Okay, uh, noise levels, sudden bursts like transient loud sounds. Mm-hmm. Um, how dangerous it is compared to prolonged exposure? They're both equally, um, of course, they're both equally causes noise-induced hearing loss. So mm-hmm. prolonged noise-induced hearing loss is obviously um, a buildup. And again, it you uh, depending on how loud is loud, right? So if it's mm. 85 decibel, it's eight hours. And if it goes higher and higher, it gets lots shorter and shorter. So obviously, uh, again, relative to the, the sound and of course, and the, the hours that you expose to it. And of course, uh, the more you hear that sound uh, collectively, then like I said, the hearing is like a wear and tear. How it dies is from through wear and tear. So of course, the longer you expose it, the quicker it dies. Um, transient noise or we call it traumatic noise Mm -hmm. so traumatic noise can also cause a permanent damage in a split second it doesn't just uh causes uh, it doesn't just cause hearing impairment on the outer hair cells it will also it could also um uh, you can also lose your eardrums it can also burst because of pressure sound is pressure so it can cause structural damage as well so again uh, any kind of loud sounds causes damage to our ear. When I say ear, it's the whole system. And it doesn't just stop at outer hair cells. It can also damage your nerves. And that is when you don't want to get to. The nerve is your precious part because once you lose your nerve, the sound will be distorted. I'm pretty sure you can relate your ears to your machines, right? So uh, so that's pretty much it. You don't want to lose your nerves, especially your nerves. So I think we've covered most of the questions that's from the attendees. And uh, I am going to wrap this up. We'll wrap this up real soon, but I've got maybe one or one more question, uh, two questions actually for okay, you so that's let, coming from I, me. I really want to answer Rining's question about Yeah, BPPV. yeah, yeah, sure, okay. sure. So BPPV is a mechanical problem whereby the stones that are supposed to be in the house of the uh, the balance system or vertigo or versus vestibular system, it, they're not supposed to go out. So those stones accidentally come out. So everybody will experience BPPV, which is benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, at least once in their lifetime. But if you have impact or some sort of accident, the stones will come out. So that, no medication can help you. What you need to do is to get a proper maneuver to bring back all the stones in. 
And it, you just need to do that once or twice and then you're done. You'll be fine. That's because when, when someone has a vertigo, you'll get nystagmus where your eyes will start dancing and it is, you feel like the world is moving. So that's, that's a vertigo for you. Okay. Uh, and um, like I said, if it's BBBV, no medication works, uh, nutrition wise, that is where vitamin D comes in. People with lack of vitamin D, especially now that we're all indoors, I'm seeing more and more BPPV cases. Mm. So for our calcium to stay in place, the stones are calcium carbonates, for them to stay in place where they're supposed to be, they need uh, vitamin D to hold them. So if you don't have enough vitamin D, then of course you'll have BPPV over and over and over again. That's all. And I think it's very important for all of you to know to take in vitamin D as well. So vitamin D is not just good for our uh, vascular system. It's also for COVID-19, to avoid mm -hmm. COVID-19. So vitamin D, C, E, uh, most importantly, and then B for your um, nerves, uh, magnesium oxide uh, for the brain, um, and the rest that I shared just now. <laughs> Okay, okay right. now your turn. You can ask me two more questions. Yeah, yeah. That's a good point about the, the vitamin D thing, right? Uh, it's definitely something that has been brought a lot more to the forefront like, of um, common knowledge, how important vitamin D is in so many areas. Like. Yeah, so that's, that's an interesting point that you brought up. Vitamin D has got, got related to, to vertigo as well. So uh, let's see. Okay. Now, that's before we wrap it up. So my question would be, I, I'll go a little bit far out because I had this question uh, in my mind. I asked this before in other um, forums, but I never got an answer. The current protocols or current treatments, for example, hearing aids, uh, cochlear implants, you know, they, they deal with the uh, hearing loss problems um, at the inner ear. Mm -hmm. Are there any, like, you know, um, treatments that are coming like you know uh, in the medical frontier that deal with with hearing loss issues beyond that you know for example I, i'm i'm like spe i'm speaking on my lane i'm not a medical expert obviously right? i'm not a doctor at all we hear that even there are some therapies using stem cells that can regenerate even eyesight you know so you can even regenerate some um, some uh some of your um, retina uh, cells as well, or even things such as uh, Neuralink that, that, that's coming up. Will it be possible to bypass your ears and send all the auditory information directly to the brain? Hmm. I love your question. Uh, there's a lot of study doing right now mm. where they are doing brainstem implant, but wow. uh, it is not a practice in Malaysia so much, but there is a light there at the end of the tunnel. We are getting there because like I said, um, auditory processing disorder is real um, for the adults as well as for children. The numbers are not big, but there are cases, right? So for instance, if you want to know if you have auditory processing disorder, you know that you when you've done your hearing assessment, your hearing is fine. You can hear the tones perfect. Your audiogram is perfect. However, you have difficulty having conversation in a noisy environment. Your brain are, is, un, are unable, is unable to process that sound. So yeah, I mean, a, a lot of studies going on right now, a lot of research going on right now. And of course, a lot of people are touching the brains right now. So, but uh, nothing, um, nothing that is uh, practiced as much for the brainstem, but there is something going on but right. having said that uh, you're talking about stem cells for the eyes and whatnot okay our outer hair, hair cells are the tiniest and the most sensitive part of our body so once you touch it it dies so that's why we still have yet to find the right um kind of um uh, cure like you were talking about prevention is better than uh, rehabilitation right so but they're still working on the cure and uh, i think whoever finds it will probably be the richest person in the world yeah, but have yet to find that person. <laughs> right, yeah. So to be take care of your hearing, right? Everyone out there? Yes. Uh, yeah, it's quite a quite a nasty thought of uh, having stem, brain stem uh, implants. But then it can be cool also. It's like a matrix. You, see, you plug it into, <laughs> into your brain. Yeah, you, just, you just never know what's going to happen in 10 years' time. You never, never know, yeah, what, know. what technology happens. Last question, uh, Doc. Mm -hmm. All right. 
Now, um, this is for those because in AES, we not only get uh, professionals who are already working in, in the audio engineering, uh, in audio industry, but you also have, we also have a lot of students. We also have a lot of younger people. Yeah, so for example, maybe if I'm a, I'm a student, I'm thinking, oh, you know, what kind of career path I want to go? Hey, you know, I want to study audio, audiology, you know, um, is that, you know, okay. is that a good path? Yeah. Oh, oh. Well, I am still an audiologist, even though I like music better, uh, but, but I'm still an audiologist. Um, audiology, if you love biology, if you love the uh, human side of sound, you want to go into audiology. Having said that, the job opportunities are still slow in Malaysia. But uh, we are getting there. Uh, people like me, I'm obviously trying to expand as much as possible so that I can have more spaces, more space for our audiologists to work. Uh, but um, due to the pandemic, it's, it is definitely slowing down. But when you talk about audiology, where do we work? Obviously, we work in the hearing industry. We work in the vertigo um, space of balance. We also work in the occupational health um, segment. Um, Recently, where I, I heard um, in the US, um, audio, audiologists work well with an audio engineer in um, orchestra. I think in one of the orchestra um, bodies or company, uh, they have an audiologist to make sure that all the musicians hearing are at you know, doing well, everybody's perfect. So, so again, in Malaysia, we have yet to go in that direction. I'm hoping for me to go into that direction because my passion in music, but a lot of audiologists uh, are very much um, medical based um, people. So obviously um, the future is there for audiologists, uh, but due to pandemic, it is slowing down. How long take. does it cost take, you know, someone who wants to study audiology? Um, a four years of mm -hmm. degree. And if you want to pursue doctor of audiology, like for me, I did it in the US. It's actually four years, but I was very lucky to do it two years. In Malaysia, we have master's for two years and then um, another two years for PhD if you want to take, um, uh, if you want to go into research. Wow. So that could be up to 10 years, right? Could be yes. Up to 10 years. Yes. I was awesome. very lucky. It took me six years. So yeah, I'm very blessed. <laughs> yeah awesome yeah all right okay uh so now uh i think we've come to the end right of our webinar already because it's already coming up to five minutes to 10 p.m so right and i, I know right over in philippines is it's already 11 p.m so thanks oh, to goodness. everyone for for uh, sticking around un until until now i just want to say on behalf of uh, everyone here right uh all the participants Thank you so much. A very, very big thank you, right, Dr. Shasta Aziz, right, for sharing your knowledge and your time with us. It's like a consultation session, man. If we were to go to see you at your clinic and all that, wow, it, it would have, you know, <laughs> it, it, thank it you would so have. Much. No, yeah. thank you so much for allowing me to share my knowledge. And I hope if you guys have any questions, please do not hesitate to buzz me on uh, Instagram or Facebook. I would, I would be more than happy to share. All right. How do we get in touch with you? Uh, maybe you can you know, email or a website. Um, like I said, it's the easiest. It's actually Instagram. You can just Instagram me, Shasa Aziz, um, or Facebook. Okay. Or if you want to have more, um, if you want to talk more professional, then you can go to Ear to Stick Hearing and Balance Center in Facebook or Ear to Stick, Ear to Stick Malaysia in IG. Right. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you okay. for your time, everybody. I hope you guys learned something. If All you right, okay. So uh, no, the, the uh, event, this whole program is officially over, right? Um, I was thinking that we would end early and then we have, you know, a little bit of time for the rest of the members to just hang around and chit chat if they want to. But since we already come up to 10 p.m., okay, All right, uh, we would uh, definitely wrap it up. I uh, just want to um, put out a... Uh, few words okay um for those of you who um enjoy this um sort of events and this sort of uh, programs uh i do encourage that you join uh, aes worldwide you can do so at the uh, the website is aes.org okay um you get access to a lot of uh, content a lot of resources their their journals videos and you know access to all their programs uh, worldwide, lah, okay? If joining AES worldwide is a little bit expensive for you, you can always join all right, our local section. So for us in Malaysia, we have the AES Malaysia section, right? And uh, over there in the Philippines, you have also the AES uh, Philippines uh, section as well, 
Okay, uh, Mr. Mike Padero is the president. Okay, um, we've got a Facebook group. A, just look for AES Malaysia. You'll find us there. We've also got Instagram, AES Malaysia. Thank you so much, right, uh, Dr. Chasa? Thank you again, everybody. And Thank you, night. everyone. Stay. Okay, so good night. Stay safe. Take care, all right? Thank you Thank so you. much for joining uh, this this program. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Good Thank night. You. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.